So, uh, my, my name is Adrian Reed. My, my topic this evening, as you can see, is leading from the middle, influencing and delivering tricky projects. And, and really what I'm talking about by leading from the middle is that, like, I, and I know we've got various disciplines in, in the room. We've got business analysts, we've got project managers, enterprise architects. Even if we've not got a formal leadership position, it's probably true that we all end up leading because we influence without authority. We've probably all been on those projects where we've had to shepherd people together to achieve some sort of common goal. And I suspect we've all worked in situations where there's been internal politics. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you have been in, in an organisation where there's internal politics, because I suspect we'd have all of our hands up, or you'd be being polite and wouldn't be wanting to, to call it out. So we're going to talk a little bit about those, those skills, because I know there's a, you know there's a whole range of, I'm a business analyst by, by trade, there's a whole range of BA techniques out there, there's a whole range of you know, EA methodologies, project management, and, and I'm sure we, we, we play, we use all of those. But it's probably also true that if we can't speak to people, then we're not going to get change progress very well in organisations. And so we, we rely on our soft skills every single day of our careers, but we probably do so without consciously thinking about it. So I want to share some tools, techniques for ways that we can, uh, that, that we can do that. You may well have seen some or perhaps even all of these techniques before. If you have it, it'll be a refresher, uh, although hopefully there'll be a few uh, new elements in, in, in to throw into the pot as well. But I want to start, I'm going to kill the slides for the next bit. Um, I want to start with a bit of a story to tell you about why I'm interested in this topic particularly. So about 10 years ago, I used to work for a financial services organisation. And it had a really good structure for BAs, because there were different market-facing business units, and the change team sat across the top as a, as a shared service. And what that meant was, as a business analyst, it was great. I was a lead business analyst. You could be parachuted into different parts of the business to work on different projects. So I learned so much in a relatively short length of time. And one day, my boss came up to me. I had just finished one project. And he came up to me and he said, Adrian, I've got this great opportunity for you. Mm. And yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know if you've ever had your boss tell you that, that they've got an opportunity for you. It normally means they've got an awful lot of work for you. And this was no exception. There was a particular part of the business that had never used business analysts before. Not only had they never used business analysts before, they openly said they don't understand, they don't want BAs in their world. And he said to me, he said, Adrian, I need you to, to work with this part of the organisation. Um, and he gave me two objectives. He said, one, I really need you to work out what their portfolio of changes is going to be for the next year, because we've got no idea what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, but he said, two, probably even more importantly, I need you to help them understand why they need business analysis and systemic and holistic thinking in their, their part of the organisation. So I was parachuted in, and the first thing I did was I asked for a desk in this part of the organisation. And it was like, it was separate. It was in the communal office, but it was separate. It was like a nine-storey building. And they gave me a desk, but it was the kind of place where you start to pick up cultural clues really, really quickly. It was different from the whole rest of the organisation. It was very hierarchical, and it was the kind of place where you could tell how senior someone was based on how much furniture they had. <laughs> so people like me, regular folk, we just had a, a, an open plan office in the middle of the you know middle of the room. If you were slightly more senior, you had a, a bit at the end here. Okay. If you were a little bit more senior than that, you had your desk against the wall so that no one could look over your shoulder to see you were actually looking at Facebook. <laughs> if you were even more senior, you had an office. And if you were the most senior, if you were director level, you had an office with a personal assistant and an executive assistant sitting outside acting like gatekeepers. <laughs> 
Now, I never, I never, it was very different to the other parts of the organisation. And the other thing I noticed was the culture, right? People were, were actively, like, really saying bad things about each other. And I've never really worked in such a toxic culture. And there were all these political games being played. But I was, a, you know, I was a lead BA. I just thought, well, I've got a job of work to do here. There, there's all sorts of politics happening around me. Um, I'm not going to get involved. I don't actually work in this part of the organisation, I'm going to ignore it. And I can tell you, that was a very successful strategy for about two weeks. <laughs> two weeks in, one Friday, one of the tasks I'd been given was to take an objective view of their projects and to send a report directly to one of the most senior managers uh, in the organisation. And one of their projects had no business case. They had chosen a solution without doing any analysis. I'm sure this doesn't ever happen anywhere else. <laughs> they, they'd chosen a solution without doing any analysis. And not only that, the more I learned about their requirements, the more I was pretty sure it wasn't going to, you know, it wasn't going to realise them value. So the top risk on my report was this project. Now it turns out the exec was aware of it. They were grateful for me raising it. It wasn't a particular surprise to them. Anyway, I come in on Monday, and I'm, I'm always a, a, an early bird, I always, I'm always in work early, and there was a middle manager who was there early as well. And I sort of just came in and said, good morning, and I got this kind of Neanderthalic grrr sound. I thought, wow, he's had a bad weekend, so I'm not going to go there right now. Um, so anyway, that was about seven in the morning, you know, we've all had grumpy Mondays, so I just ignored it. About 10 a.m., I went over and said, look, you know, can I get you a coffee? And almost before I'd finished that sentence, he said, Adrian, I have got something I've got to get off my chest. Come into this meeting room. I can still remember this like it was yesterday. He led me into this meeting room, and it was one of those offices where it had glass partition walls. He led me in, opened the door, and slammed the door behind him. I'm not sure if you've ever seen glass partitions vibrate like they're going to fall over. <laughs> it's more scary than it sounds. And so I'm standing here, and he's there between me and the, and, and the door. And he just starts yelling. Like he starts yelling. He was yelling things like, um, Who the hell do you think you are? Who the hell do you think you are? Sending this report to our exec. He didn't actually use the word hell, he used a much worse word, but you folks look far too polite to hear the word he actually used. <laughs> Who the hell are you to send this report? You're just a BA, you're just here to write the requirements, you're just here to do as we tell you to do. And I'm really taken aback. And the one thing I can remember, it's funny what sticks in your mind, is his gesticulation, his body language. He was doing this weird thing where he was like, pointing at temples and saying, how could you do this? Really quite a, a sort of violent um, uh, reaction. Anyway, I, I really didn't know how to react. I just let him burn himself out. He just went on and on for what's, I mean, it was probably only five minutes. It felt like an hour. Eventually, I was able to explain uh, why I was there. I was able to understand his concerns. I'd, I'd be lying if I said we left that room as friends, but we could at least continue working together. And I, I built on that relationship over the forthcoming months. It was touch and go for a while. I went back to my desk in that shared office space, and I had this sort of aha moment, because previously I'd been, thought, I'd been thinking, well, I'm not going to get involved with this politics. But like, the reality is I just sat down and thought, I am involved. Like, we're all involved in our organisation's politics. If you're in a situation, uh, you're part of it. And it was naive of me to think that I could just ignore it. A few years later, I came across a model which I really wish I'd known about then. Um, incidentally, there's short references at the bottom of all the models. There's a slide with all the, the full references at the, at the end. So if you do want to download any of the source papers or stuff, you can get a copy of the slides and, and, and do that. And um, two authors, Baddersley and James, uh, came up with this model. And it's a four-box <coughs> grid, very, very, very simple, but by no means simplistic. You've got political awareness, from very politically aware to unaware. Uh, and whether someone's 
playing psychological games, or whether they're acting with integrity. And if you think about where I was in that exchange, in that scary sort of glass room, well, I was completely politically unaware, but I was acting with integrity. Like, genuinely, I wanted the best thing for the organisation. And so you might say I was acting in a very innocent way, and if you think about a, a, an animal that you might associate with innocence, people will often talk about an innocent little lamb. So it's like the innocent little lamb there. And, and the thing about lambs is they're, they're like fairly inoffensive, aren't they? I can't really imagine anyone being offended by lambs. You, know, you don't hear people saying, I hate those lambs with their cute little fluffy tails. But there's also the other expression about lambs, like a lamb to the slaughter. And that was exactly the situation I'd inadvertently put myself in. So up in the top left, it turns out the manager, the middle manager that I had that interaction with, he was um, playing some psychological games, um, but he was very, very politically aware. He was super politically aware. So we might say that he was being a clever fox. And he was being quite clever, I found out subsequently, because he was very fearful of a, an organisational restructure that he thought might happen, which subsequently proved to be correct. So he was acting rationally, albeit that he wasn't necessarily acting with uh, the fullest of integrity. And it's almost like that sort of clever fox had jumped down to devour the innocent little lamb. And that's kind of could be a really dangerous position to be in. And down here, to complete the model, an ultimate square. Um, if people play psychological games and they're politically unaware, um, they're sometimes considered as the inept donkeys. <laughs> and, and you will have come across these people, I'm sure. They're the people who you'll just be kind of going along in your project or whatever, and they'll just suddenly kick you for no reason. <laughs> and you'll be like, why did you do that? And they'll be like, I don't know. <laughs> but they're trying, right? They're trying something. Um, but as with any four box grid, there's one grid, one quadrant which is considered better, and it's normally the top right. And here we have our wise owls. Okay, um, the owl I think is a great metaphor. You think about owls; they, they have the ability to see holistically from above, look down at the, the, the landscape, but also swoop down as well. So it's an interesting metaphor. And what I, I what I now know in retrospect is I needed, although I didn't know this model at the time, I needed to move up that that ladder move towards uh, that, that sort of <coughs> wise owl uh, perspective. Now if you do uh, go on and read the paper, and I will, if you Google these two authors you'll find it. Um, one thing that's not always appreciated with this model is there's also significance to the two dimensions. So the first dimension is about how we as practitioners of change, how we read the situation and how we read the complexity of the political and the, the, you know, the, the nature of the problem or whatever we're working with. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk predominantly about things that relate to that um, dimension. However, the other dimension is about how we carry ourselves, uh, which is another, I mean, that could be a whole other presentation, but about how we, you know, uh, how, how we move towards acting with integrity. So I'm going to focus mainly on reading. And I don't know about you, but I find the projects I work on, it's, it can be a real challenge to read the situation. Because stakeholders like to make things sound like they're really simple. And I, 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 again, I don't know if you find the same, but I find some, sometimes you know, the project brief or the reason that, that stakeholders launch a project, it's like, I, I think in pictures, and it's almost like they say, well, you know what, Adrian, we just need to change the pink ball of yarn. Uh, and I say, well, isn't there a, a red and a blue one? Yeah, yeah, but they're completely separate. Yeah? So we, it's just the IT. Don't worry about the pr process and the people. Type of thing. And, you, and you find that, well, actually, aren't there other processes and IT systems? Yeah, yeah, but they're completely separate. You don't even need to worry about that at all. But of course, we know as practitioners of change that life is never that simple. The strings are never as simple as people might like us to believe. It's more likely in an organisational situation that we've got processes, people, politics, all mixed up in this big spaghetti nest of a, of a, of a mess. 
And so often what projects, if we're not careful, projects can very well intentionally go and pull on one of these and see what happens. But the art in what we do as practitioners of change um, is to like, de-spaghettify, if that's a word, untangle uh, that, that mess, or at least understand where the intervention will be most useful. So I'm going to talk about all of these things, but I want to split the rest of the presentation into three main parts, all of which are related. We've, we've talked about politics. I, I want to talk a little bit about stakeholder analysis, and I sense that most, if not all of us in here, probably do that without thinking. There's a technique I'll show you that you may have seen before. There's a, a slightly newer one in there as well. I then want to talk about situational analysis. There's a couple of sort of systems thinking techniques in there that we'll just have a quick look at. Um, and then very briefly at the end, I want to talk about engaging uh, and leading and bring everything together. Um, and there'll be a few minutes for questions at the end as well. So if you do have a question, um, feel free to hold it uh, until the end. So starting at the very beginning, the stakeholder analysis. Well, I'm pretty sure many, most, all of us have probably you know, read about done stakeholder engagement before, identification, categorization, and we have probably seen grids that look something like this. Okay. This is a grid that happens to be from IIBA's business analysis body of knowledge, and it has two dimensions, impact, so how impacted a particular stakeholder is by a problem or a change, and how influential they are. Um, so raise your hand if you've seen used a grid, that, either this one or something similar to it. So probably about 60% of us, okay, fantastic. And, and it's a good tool, right? And I, I'm not dissing it, it's a good tool. I mean, you know, it's, if you haven't used it, it's very, very effective. But if you have used it, you might have found that sometimes, particularly in those messy situations when we really need to influence, you get people who don't sit in one neat place. You get a stakeholder who's like, we well, go, well, actually, yeah, they're, they're sort of broadly here because they're very impacted by it, they're very influential, so, you know, they're, they're there. Oh, well, except for the non-functional requirements where they're here, because the architects have got more uh, influence on those. And maybe for the scanning and workflow, they're here, and for the business change, they're, they're here. And so they're, they're not really in one place. And then you might have other stakeholders who are in different places as well, and other stakeholders, and... <clears throat> and, and, and all of a sudden you've got a very, very busy matrix, and it can be very, very hard to read. I always think um, it looks like a sort of fly swatter, <laughs> someone swatted lots of flies on the, on, on the paper. So a technique that we might use instead of, instead of or as well as this technique, uh, is a technique known as the stakeholder intensity, uh, interest intensity index. And this is a way of thinking about our stakeholders, because if we're going to influence them, we need to know who they are, what their interests are, um, but think about the particular areas that interest them. And the way it works is you take a particular stakeholder, you consider an area, and you give them a score from 1 to 5 of vested interest, and from 1 to 5 of influence. And so here's an example. You can see we've got areas of interest here, so you can see you've got the stakeholders across here, and we've got scores in here. So for example, uh, customers have a one for interest and influence, call centre here, you can see they're very interested but not very influential about scanning the workflow. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, well that, <coughs> that, that's interesting, but it's not, not really any easier to read than the, than the fly spotter, and I agree with you. But there is a formula that comes with this <coughs> technique, um, which you can, and you can plug all of this into Excel. Except Excel will do all of this for you. Uh, but if you apply the formula, the square root of v times i over 25, um, what that does is it gives you a relative uh, number, well, a number between 0 and 1, for each of the particular quadrants there. Again, that's more useful, but still quite hard to read. But you can then use Excel or whatever, you can set up some rules to create a heat map. And this is where it starts to become, as a practitioner, uh, really useful. Because you know you've got particular stakeholders 
who, who are particularly interested or influential for particular parts of the change, the initiative. So rather than having that two-dimensional view, we've got a more of a three-dimensional view. It's, it's never precise, it's never scientific, it's never precise, we need to use judgment of course, but it can help signpost the fact that, for example, for the online portal, we've got some really key stakeholders and some that we just need to keep in the loop. Uh, but, other, you know, but, but, but finance will be important for other areas. So really, really useful technique. <clears throat> but of course, stakeholders will probably have different views, different perspectives on this big, messy, spaghetti nest, coiled uh, uh, wire that we have in the middle here. And I should have warned you, and I apologise I didn't warn you, but I am going to ask you for a little bit of audience interaction. Okay, and that piece of audience interaction is coming up. But I know, because I know what it's like late on a Monday, um, I do also have a couple of prizes for the first people I hear to shout out um, in this. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to shout out your first gut response to a particular question I'm going to ask you. So I will define the question, then just shout out your gut response to it. I'm not looking for a right or a wrong answer. Don't self-censor. And my question is, let's define it first, uh, what is the Parking Enforcement Service for? I don't know if it's called the same thing here in Belgium, but in the UK, the Parking Enforcement Service are those nice people that put little tickets on your window when you park somewhere that you shouldn't. So what is the Parking Enforcement Service for? Money! Money, okay. <laughs> so, we have a round of applause for the So, I mean, it, you know, it, it could be for anything, really. It could, it could be for making money for the city. That's a commonly, uh, you know, a common uh, purpose. It could be for safety of the, uh, you know, the motorists or the pedestrians or whatever. And it's like, but who's right? This sort of depends on who you ask, right? It, it, it may exist for several perceived reasons. So there are various ways we could analyse that, but very briefly, one approach, uh, one technique known as the, the PQR formula, um, which is from uh, Chaplin's soft systems methodology, if you're interested, and this is just a small uh, fragment of it, but essentially you can state things, do, do P by Q in order to contribute to what you That's a bit of a, a convoluted, clumsy statement probably for our our world as change practitioners, we can reframe that as a particular thing, it's a system to do something by <coughs> some means to contribute towards achieving some ends. And it, you can think about that, almost put ourselves in our stakeholders' shoes and think, what do they think this system, this process, this organisation is actually for? Because if we're going to influence and create a shared goal, we kind of need to probably think about that. We, we, I'm sure we do this intuitively, but bringing it to the front of our minds is, is probably even, even more effective. So a couple of examples, just off the top of, top of my head. Uh, well, for the parking service, the parking service might be uh, existing to generate revenue for motorists that break the law by diligently issuing tickets. This is in order to contribute towards an overall goal of balancing the city's books. It's almost like Stefan saw my slides in advance. <laughs> Um, on the other side, it could be um, the parking enforcement services systems keep road users and pedestrians safe by issuing fines and providing useful information education to those who park illegally. Okay. And it's quite likely in any municipality or city that there will be different people with those different views. So if we're going to gain some kind of consensus or accommodation between them, knowing that those views exist is really important. So just rewinding to that idea of the intensity index, we can almost imagine that you take for each of our stakeholder groups, we now know what they're particularly interested in from project or initiative or intervention, and we also think about what their perspectives are. And in doing that, it's just one way, one possible way of, you know, I, I talked about nudging myself up in, in that example from the, the lamb to the owl. This is one way that we could uh, start to, to think about consciously doing that. I'm sure we all do it subconsciously. <coughs> Okay, 
next we've talked a little bit about stakeholder analysis. So I want to talk briefly about um, analysis of situations. And it's a challenge, isn't it? Because I, I don't know about you, but I find that the projects that I work on, there's never enough time. Um, and you're parachuted in, and you discover that, that there's this messy situation, and people are angry. Uh, and not only are people angry, but everything's on fire. <clears throat> because the server's going out of support, and we, promised it, you know, we, we, we were promised it yesterday. So there's this sense of urgency. And there are all sorts of political undertones happening uh, alongside the formal project as well. And of course we'll go out and we'll elicit information about the situation. We'll do our workshops, our interviews. We'll use five whys or ten whys or however many whys that we need. Um, but it can be a challenge to say, well, how do we bring all of that together? And one way um, is a humble old rich picture. Um, hands up if you're familiar with the rich picture as a technique. Okay, that's good. It's unusual. It's not. It's one that often people haven't heard of. Um, I mean, there are some very specific definitions of what a rich picture is. I would say, as a practitioner, um, really the only rule of a rich picture is there are no rules. Um, and this this would be a great room for a rich picture because you can write on all the surfaces or pretty much all of them. But if you've ever got round a whiteboard with some colleagues and said, let's draw the problem, that is probably a form of a rich picture. But the idea being you don't just have to draw the hard things like systems, processes, you can draw people, you can draw attitudes. It's like a mental model. And it's not normally, it doesn't have to be an artefact that's shared. Uh, and in fact, if you put some of the controversial stuff on there, it's probably best not to particularly if you put people that disagree and, and don't like each other. Um, so that probably sounds a bit abstract, so I have a, a worked example for you, um, which is a sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's a pattern I've seen in some organisations, but it doesn't represent any real clients, so it's not, uh, it's not confidential. So in this imaginary, hypothetical organisation, you can see you've got the managing director and the board that are unhappy, and they're placing pressure on the operations director, who must cut, cut costs. He's passing that on to the courier, the delivery firm, who are saying, we can't be that cheap. Uh, they're trying, uh, but they're delivering parcels that are late and incorrect. You have a poor customer over here saying they never deliver when they say they will, so they're having to ring the call centre, and the call centre can't help because they've got a very snazzy web front end that's not connected to the legacy back end. You've got this whole disconnect here. And in fact, information gets between them through the, the miracle of print and rekey. So you've got people rekeying into a, uh, another system there. You've got conflict. So you can show conflict with those crossed swords, conflict between the people who are rekeying and the ops director. You've got conflict between the warehouse. There's not enough, there's, people, there's stuff piling up. Uh, and you've got the only people who seem to be happy here are the marketing team who for some reason the board love, and they're saying, let's advertise great service. <laughs> so advertising great service, which of course creates an expectation of great service, the customer's really, really disappointed. Now, I, I, I mean, I know this is just a, a, a small fragment of an example, but you can imagine that, like, if the stakeholders had said, look, we just need to put an interface in here, that will solve all of, all of our problems. It's like, well, actually, you've got a whole series of problems here of which the IT is only part. And it can start to create those conversations about the, you know, the holistic nature of the, <coughs> the problem and the situation that we find ourselves in. By the way, this you wouldn't have to draw it this artistic. I, mean, I know that's you know, this is sort of mediumly artistic. But if you were drawing it on a whiteboard, just stick people, you know, that's fine. I tend to just draw stick people. And this one I've, I've had redrawn just because it's in a presentation, but stick people are fine. If you wanted something a bit more structured, a technique that we could use is a, a multiple cause diagram. Now, a multiple cause diagram is relatively simple, uh, but very effective. It's the kind of diagram that doesn't require much explanation. And if you can just get stakeholders around a whiteboard or a big piece of flip chart paper, 
and get them all pitching in. It's, it's great. So I'll show you an abstract example, then I'll show you a partial real example. Uh, this is an abstract example. So you can see we've got some form of negative thing here, a negative event or state. So maybe there's been some negative event, like we've had a data breach. Oh, no, we're going to get fined. Um, what caused that? Or some form of change in state, like our profits are dropping, and they're continuing to drop. What should we do? And you work with people, you get, you, know, you get as much data as you can, you brainstorm, whatever, all the elicitation that we do normally, and you figure out all of the causes, the, the sub-causes, the primary, tertiary, and so on. And the literal meaning of an arrow is, so this means that G either causes A, or makes A worse, or exacerbates A, or has some sort of, there's some cause-effect relationship between them. Now what's really interesting, and I sense we've probably all seen situations in our own organisations where what stakeholders do is they say, let's solve, solve in inverted commas, A and B. And you solve A and B only to find they recur again because they're caused by deeper root causes. Okay. So it creates those conversations. It's a way of leading, nudging people to think about the situation differently. So we're influencing people to think a bit, a bit broader. So again, that's abstract. Um, this next example, it, it doesn't project terribly well, but the slides will be available after if you'd like to uh, take a more detailed look at it. Um, what you have here at the bottom is an increase in customer complaints and reduced customer retention. Now in this particular example, you've got a whole bunch of causal chains emerging. So you can see at the top, you've got pressure on budgets, which means there's pressure for operational improvement, which means that management are applying blunt metrics, and of course you get what you measure, generally. So call centre staff are incentivised on call centre on the number of calls they take, which means they're rushing the calls. And they're rushing the calls, which means they don't answer the customer's query, they also miss key the customer information, which means customers are dissatisfied, which means that you've got an increase in customer complaints and so on. But there's a whole... Other, there's, there's whole other uh, chains of causation happening there as well. You tend to get, on, in real examples, chains and hubs. Hubs where everything's leading to and, and, and chains. What's really interesting with this example is this is actually a bit of a, um, a, a doom loop because if you think about it, if customers get less satisfied, then you've got less profit generally, which means you've got even more pressure on budgets which means the whole thing reinforces itself and gets worse and worse. So again, if you think about leading influencing, if we're able to encourage uh, analysis to intervene in these places so that we can really address the root causes, then we'll, we'll create better outcomes for our organisations, our stakeholders, our customers, all of those sorts of things. So we've talked about stakeholder analysis with our interest impact grid and the fly slotter but also the intensity index and the PQR to think about the perspectives. We talked about rich pictures and multiple cause diagrams for situational analysis. I, I want to talk a little bit now about engaging and leading. Because I think sometimes it, it, it would be easy for us to think that to be a leader we have to be a manager, that we have to have you know, direct reports. But a diagram I really like, which is from the, the 2013 book, Business Analysis and Leadership, and if you're a, a BA or even if you're not, it's a, well worth getting that book. Um, Penny Pullum created this diagram, um, which I always think of like an onion. It's like an onion diagram. <laughs> You've got a, like, even if you're the only BA, EA, PM, change practitioner, or whatever, functional analyst, um, well, well, even if you're the only, only one, you're still leading yourself. Um, but the reality is probably you're working on a project, and you are probably shepherding people together. You get people with different views, you're helping to shepherd. That's leading, it's, you know, it's influencing, it's, it's, it's sort of servant leadership. You may well be leading within your organisation without even thinking about it. If you've like, worked to raise the, the profile of your team, if people didn't know what a business analyst was or an enterprise architect or whatever, and you've helped them understand, that's, that's organisational leadership. And the fact that, that you're, you know, all of us are here is arguably a sense 
than we are leading in the wider world because we're sharing information and you know we'll all be networking, sharing experiences, that's exchanging learning between organizations. So we might, you know, you might also choose to blog or you know speak at IIBA events or whatever, which is an example of that leading in the wider world as well. So leadership has different levels. I mean, this is just one suggested number of levels, but it doesn't have to just be about formal uh, management situations. So it's worth thinking about where our power comes from. And this next slide is, is really, as I say, a business analyst by trade. So this is really probably with a little bit of a BA lens on this next slide. But you can start to think about where a business analyst power comes from. And there's a lot written about um, where power comes from generally. Uh, and certainly as a business analyst, or probably many of us here, one source of power can be rules and regulations. If you've ever made someone fill in a change request form, even though you could have got the change through quickly anyway, that's probably an example of where you've used rules and regulations. Now, there may, there's normally a very good reason for that, but generally speaking, people don't warm well. People don't like that form of power. It feels very bureaucratic. So we might need to lean on it sometimes, but it's not always the, the most effective source of power. There's also boundaries. And, and again, whatever your role, you probably control boundaries more than you think. Because I just imagine the last time you um, arranged a workshop, or a meeting, or a, you know, whatever, you probably decided who was going to be there. You probably decided who could actually make it, because let's face it, if you've got 10 people, you look at the diaries, and, and some people can, some people can't. You probably had a big influence over the agenda. And again, with a business analyst lens on, who you invite, when you hold that meeting, the techniques you use in that workshop affects the requirements you get out. So we can inadvertently end up affecting the scope. So we've got to probably be a little bit careful with that one. So again, it's not good or bad, it just is, but we need to probably be aware of that. So if the ones at the top are, are things that are, are, are perhaps things to be wary of, well at the bottom, networks and information is, is normally a positive. So if you think about it, as practitioners have changed, you know, people like people that can get stuff done. And business analysts, enterprise architects, all, you know, all of these roles, we are people that get stuff done. And it, but it's not like any one of us can do it on our own. We tend to have formal and informal networks throughout the organisation that can get stuff done. And that's really, really powerful. I think often more powerful than we, than we realise. But what I want to talk about briefly is management of meaning. Because I'd suggest one way that we influence, uh, probably every, every one of us I'd imagine, um, is how we talk about the project and how we create a shared vision. So I was clearing out a drawer in my old desk, in my desk in my office a couple of years back, and it struck me how much communication has changed with consumers. So this is a manual for a Nokia 7250 phone. I don't know if any of you had this phone. It was the one that looks like that. Um, I can remember being really excited because it was the first colour phone I ever had. It wasn't a smartphone. I think it had WAP. Do you remember WAP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and there are uh, 102 pages in this manual. If you ever owned a Nokia in that era, you'll know that the first Nokia you bought, you had to read the manual. They weren't very intuitive. Once you'd owned one, you could operate all of them. But there was a bit of a learning curve. Now, I want you to think back to your, the last phone you bought. And I want you to imagine now opening the box. How many pages were in the instruction manual? Yeah. Like one or none? I mean, I've got an, an Android phone as it happens, and I don't think it even came with instructions. I think I just switched it on and it prompted me to do stuff. So as consumers, we expect really, uh, you know, really pertinent information 
contextually relevant when we need it. But within organisations, we don't always communicate like that. We've, we've probably all seen very long PowerPoint decks. I don't know if you've ever been in a presentation on a Friday at like 5 or 6 p.m. where someone's at the slide and they always have the little counter in the corner that says slide 17 of 154. And you're like, I do want to go home. <coughs> And I know, I know, so talking about effectiveness of a communication, I know it's dangerous to talk politics as a Brit, but, but I'm, but I'm going <laughs> to. Because one of the most complex issues in British politics at the moment, no surprise to you, is Brexit. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the pros and cons. As it happens, I'm a staunch Remainer. I think what's happening is, is an, an, an embarrassing and crazy. But what I would say is the Leave campaign had a far, far more effective way of communicating with people than the Remain campaign. And I want to show you just one example of this. I don't know if you would have seen this, I don't know whether this crossed the, the, the borders in the media, uh, but the, the Leave campaign had a bus. Yeah, yeah. The, the red bus. bus. Yeah, none of it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, none of it's true. But we send the EU 350 million a week. Let's fund our NHS instead. Vote leave. Let's take back control. <coughs> now, putting the ethics of it to one side, because it was all demonstrably untrue. But as a message, it was really effective. It's like they drove that bus into people's minds, and it stuck. And it's repeatable and it's tweetable. And the Remain campaign had nothing like that. And I, and I truly believe <coughs> that the mechanism, the word, the linguistics of the campaign had, had a lot to do with it. But imagine if your organisation was doing an internal presentation trying to give the same message. I bet in many corporate organisations it would look something like this. A historic referendum is approaching. You will have the ability to make difference. The Leave campaign thinks that the UK pays too much. We can't pay blah, 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 blah. You probably tuned out already. <laughs> I mean, we talk about, I mean, we probably heard people say death by PowerPoint. I think that's unfair to Microsoft PowerPoint. It's really death by bullet point. Because <laughs> people won't remember that. What they remember is this. It, it just, as I say, drove into people's collective consciousness and, and had the evol uh, the uh, had the effect that the drivers wanted. Um, actually, does anyone raise, does anyone speak German here? So a few people, okay, well, then I apologise in advance because I'm about to try and say a German word and I know I can't pronounce it. So, so one of you can teach me how to say this word properly after. Um, I'm told in German there's a word, Erwurm? Close enough. Orwurm, okay. Uh, okay, oh, fantastic. We can, we can... <laughs> You can have it, earworm. Yeah, yeah, earworm. Yeah, I'm told it translates to earworm uh, in, in, in the UK. But I'm told that particularly in, uh, in German, it, it, it has a specific meaning, which is uh, it's like a, a, a tune or a, a ditty that gets stuck in your head. And you know when you like listen to something on the radio and it's stuck in your head, it's like the screensaver of your mind for the rest of the day. Well, that bus, that bus became the earworm. <laughs> And that phrase became the earworm. So think about managing meaning. Think about if we want to influence. And I would never say in the unethical way of the Brexit example, but if we can nudge people towards a shared objective by thinking about the way we talk about project objectives. So actually the UK government does have examples where it does this. They have whole programmes that are built around digital by default. Now, as a one-liner, that's really quite a compelling, understandable piece. You know, we're aiming for digital by default. I was working with a client a while back that had a mantra of um, automate, the automate the majority, manage the minority. You know, it's rhythmic. It, ri it, it rides off the tongue. But people buy into it. So maybe we could borrow some of the mechanisms uh, that people from the marketing arena use to get our message across too. Because what we're really doing when we're working with our stakeholders when we're in that mess, oops, sorry, when we're in that mess, is we're learning our way through. It's like no, no individual person has all of the answers, um, but collectively uh, we, we probably have enough to 
create a project or intervention that, that will actually work. So it's about influencing a lot of stakeholder analysis, understanding the, the situation, um, thinking about not just the, the two-dimensional group, but maybe the intensity index and also the PQR and the perspectives, maybe using a rich picture as well as, uh, or, or instead of a multiple cause diagram, uh, and then thinking about how we engage and lead and talk about our uh, the, the compelling outputs of our projects. So final ponder point before I close for a few questions. I open with a story about me being politically naive. Uh, we probably all, if we are honest, we probably all experience that from time to time. My, my question is, how many projects and organisations have failed because of some kind of political factor or because it was actually a messy ball of wool that we didn't have the chance to unravel. Um, but more importantly, what could we do as, a, you know, as an enthused community of change practitioners to help avoid that, um, to deliver better business outcomes for our stakeholders, our, our customers, and even more importantly, for the communities in which we live. And with that, I will say thank you. Thank you.